Hello, welcome to Coding Projects. I'm Mark Lassoff. We've got a really exciting show for you today. We're going to be doing the Long Island Railroad Project coming up. Hi, and welcome to Coding Projects. I really hope you enjoy this project. We're going to be building a geolocation based project using Google Maps API for JavaScript. We're going to use also data from the Long Island Railroad to drop pins every place where there's a Long Island Railroad station. If you're not familiar with the Long Island Railroad, it is the biggest commuter railroad in the world. Big system, lots of stops, lots of data. Let's take a look. I've got my terminal open here and I'm pointed to the correct folder that holds the application. So let's go ahead and run our simple Python server. And that's simple HTTP server running on port 8080. And let's run our application. So we'll bring up the web browser and we're going to use localhost 8080 to run the application. You'll see the application loads and it drops pins where all of the Long Island, Long Island Railroad stations are. And if I click on the pin, it tells me which station that is. That's the famous Penn Station in Manhattan. And if we go way out to the east end of Long Island, the furthest station away from Penn Station is Montauk Station, this being Montauk Point in the home of the famous Montauk Lighthouse. So you can see exactly what the app does here. Anybody can click on one of these and see exactly what station that is. So let's talk for a minute about where we got the data from in order to create this application. We'll start with the actual Google API. So all the maps come from the Google Maps platform and specifically the Maps JavaScript API. There's a really great tutorial here for getting started and creating your first map. We, of course, used more features that are available here in this tutorial to drop the pins. Important thing to note, you're going to need to go ahead and get your own API key. An API key is simply an identifier for you so that when your application contacts the API, they know it's your application and you're legit. Obviously, I'm going to disable the actual API key that I used once the application uh, finishes running here because I don't want you using my API key. So we've got a couple of different files here. We've got index.html, which is our base HTML file, key.js, which has my API key, a little bit of CSS, and then we've got our stationmap.js and stops.js. Let's go ahead and bring these into our development environment. Adam is a popular text editor and one of my favorites right now. I'm going to go ahead and open the project folder here. So we'll navigate to the project folder on my desktop, L-I-R-R -R project. And that'll give me access to all of the files. I'm going to close this little welcome here. We don't need that. And let's go ahead and go through the files once again. We have our index.html. Really nothing here. This is our basic HTML file. And a couple of things worth noting is we've got our viewport tag. The purpose of the viewport is essentially to tell mobile devices to display this screen at 100% magnification. Don't zoom out and try and display everything. That's why we have that initial view state set to 1.0. We have our character set, and then we have a link to the station map CSS style sheet, which actually only has two entries in it. One for the map div, which I'll show you in a second, which sets the height to 100% and another for the HTML and body tag, setting the height to 100% and no margin or padding. This actually came straight from the Google documentation. You remember when the map displays, it displays in the full browser window or the full window of whatever's showing it. So that's why we needed that CSS. All right, so now we get into the body of our document. There is a logical division that holds our map. It's ideas map. And then we attach to a couple of scripts, stationmap.js, the script from the Google APIs to run Google Maps, 
along with my key and then a script called stops.js and then a link to, we actually have two links here to the station map style sheet. That's an error, we don't need both of those. So we could actually take one of those out. Okay, so that's essentially the HTML, just links to the different JavaScript and CSS files that we've got. Now stops.js is just a data file. This is all of the stations, their name and location. I got this from the Metropolitan Transit Authority API website, which you can go to and get your own username and password and get access to all of this New York MTA data. Now this looks kind of like a mess. If we were to copy this, we can use a JSON viewer site to format this data for us. And that's my favorite one, online JSON viewer. So we just actually copy all the JSON into here and then click the viewer and it formats it for us. So here are all of the stations numbered zero through 123. And we can go into any of the stations and we can see the properties. And the properties just has the stop name and the geometry, which essentially is where it's located. We have a latitude and a longitude value. It's pretty accurate here. You don't need to be necessarily this accurate, but this gives us great accuracy. And you can see it has the same data for all of these. This is Woodside, negative 7390 and 40.74. So this is a data file that I used and we brought this in in the JSON format so it became a JSON object. The JSON format natively becomes a JSON object so we can parse it like any other JSON object. It becomes very easy to work with in this format. We could have used XML but then we would have had to gone through the XML iteratively with a loop and parse the XML. So this is a lot easier. Okay, so we've got our index so let's take a look at our station map.js and this essentially is the heart of our application. Now a lot of this content again came straight from the actual API documentation. So on line one we have var map. So we're declaring a variable that will hold our map. The reason we're declaring it on line one and outside of any of the functions is we want this to be global. We're going to be able to reference this map variable anywhere in the application. And then our code is broken down into a function that initializes the map, a drop marker function, which drops the individual markers on the location of each station. Now this code looks very complicated. So I do advise when you go through it on your own, you go through it line by line. That's exactly what we're going to do. So the init map function is actually called by the Google Maps API to initialize the map. If we look here in the index.html, you can see here we've got our link to the maps API and this callback equals init map. That's what says, okay, the callback function is going to be init map. And once the library loads, it's going to call that init map function right here to initialize the map. This file, this uh, function name could have been Ernie and Bert. I used a knit map because obviously that makes the most sense. And it's also what they used in the documentation. Okay, so the first thing that happens is we're going to initialize this map object. We call a new instance of google.maps.map. And we pass this some information. So this is inside the Google Maps API. We're passing it first of all the logical division where our map lives. So document get element by ID map. Now don't be confused. The map here in the single quotes is referring to the logical divisions ID, not the variable map we created in the JavaScript. Get element by ID. So we're getting that element from the HTML by its ID. So the ID is map we're getting this element right here, which is where our map's going to be displayed. ID equals map. So we're passing that into the callback function. 
And then we have some map options. Now these map options are how you configure the map. We're only using a couple of them. There's actually, I think over a dozen different options we can use that control how the map looks and what features of the map we're gonna be using. We're only using a couple of these. The first one, obviously, we need to give the center point of the map. So we pass that a latitude and a longitude. In this case, I chose 40.7891 a longitude of 73135, which approximately displays all of Long Island at a zoom level of nine. Take a quick look at our application again. So when we load it, we'll go ahead and refresh here. That's the zoom level nine and displays all of Long Island. I might've zoomed in a little bit more, I think, and uh, just displayed that, but it gives us the full view of Long Island and the center point is the latitude and longitude we've provided here to the API. We wanted the street view control off, so I set that to false. Now, I went ahead here and stations.features and I assigned that to a variable marker. Now you don't see a stations variable defined anywhere. Do you remember where it is? So this constant stations dot features parses the XML and gets us to all of the stations within the XML. So we've essentially stored this now as JSON data inside of this variable called markers and we've bypassed the first level of the JSON, the features. So whenever you have a lot of data stored in JSON or in XML, the way you go through it is with a loop. Now, we simply have to go through it one station at a time to get the data out to figure out where we're gonna drop the markers. So the loop is set up here. We have our for loop and we initially set our counter at zero. We're gonna keep looping while the counter is less than the number of markers less than the number of markers, which of course is the number of stations. And we'll increase this value by one each time through the loop. As we go through the loop for each station, we're gonna get three pieces of information. So first time through we're on markers zero, and we're gonna get properties.stopName, and geometries coordinates one, and geometries coordinate zero. We're gonna assign these respectively to the local variable station name, latitude and longitude. So we're gonna extract that all from our JSON data. So first time through the loop, we're on station zero. We're gonna get properties.stopName, right? Remember from the code, it's properties.stopName, geometry, coordinates zero, coordinates one. Take a look, quick look at the code again. Properties.stopName, geometry coordinates one, geometry coordinate zero. So that's how we get the data into local variable station name, latitude, and longitude. Once we have that, we're gonna pass that to our drop marker function, latitude, longitude, and station name. So at this point, our map has been displayed. We have our map and we're gonna loop through all of the data and on that map, we're gonna drop our, our markers at the latitude, longitude and station name provided. So as we go through the data, one station at a time from zero to one to two to three, e for each one of those, we're gonna pass the latitude, longitude, and station name to this drop marker function. So in essence, this drop marker function is gonna run over and over again as we go through all the stations. Once we're out of stations, then the function's over. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a location object with the latitude and longitude. We label the latitude lat, longitude long, and we put it in this object here. So this is our location object. We're also gonna create a content string with the station name that's been passed in. And from that station name, we're gonna create an information window. 
Now this is also from the Google Maps API. The information window is initialized with new google.maps.info window and we pass it the content object. The info window, if you don't remember when we were looking at the actual app running, is what pops up when we click elements on the map. Oyster Bay, that's the info window. Hicksville, that's the info window. So that's part of the map's object, but we're configuring it with the name of the station from the data. So we're looping through, we've got the latitude, longitude, and station name, we're creating the info window object, and now we're gonna create a marker object. This is also from the Maps API. The marker object is a new instance of google.maps.marker. In order to drop the marker, it requires the position, which is our location object we just created, latitude and longitude, the map that we're talking about, which is the map here, the only map we have, the one we've been referencing the whole time, and then the title of the marker is the station name. Now that's not enough to make this work because you notice that the little information window only opened when I clicked on it. So now we've got to set up the click event. So we're going to set up a click listener. So on the marker, and remember we're creating one marker at a time. So this is one marker with one latitude, longitude, and station name. We're going to add a listener. We're going to be listening for the click event. And when that click event occurs, we're gonna run this anonymous function, which on the info window object, opens it on our map and our marker. So each individual pin that we drop, each individual marker that we drop, has an event listener listening for a click. When that click occurs, we run the function, which opens the info window with the map and the marker. That's pretty much our application. We've called the Google Maps API, we've generated our map, we've passed it a latitude and longitude, and some options to configure how the map is displayed. We then took an external data source, which included station names, latitude, and longitude. We looped through every element in the data source. We used that information, latitude, longitude, and station name, to drop pins and create information windows on the map. This is the basis for every Google Maps project you're gonna do. Once you've done it once or twice, I promise you, using Google Maps becomes second nature. Hey, thanks for watching Coding Projects with Mark Lassoff. Really appreciate your time. Hope you enjoyed the project. I'll see you next time.